Uh, thank you. At the outset, I'd like to thank the organizer for this opportunity to come to this beautiful university. In fact, I belong to Calcutta, and therefore, this gives me extra nostalgia. Now, I'll be talking about gut microbiota and digestive diseases. Before me, Saurabh talked about neonates, infants, and how microbiota is acquired. Now, let us imagine, now we have become adult, we sometimes fall ill, sometimes remain healthy. Can our microbial alteration explain what we have as an illness in our digestive tract? Now, before I go to that, let me tell you, I reiterate what Saurabh said. We have 10 to the power 13 human cells in our body, but we have 10 to the power 14 microbial cells. So we are all egoistic, we think we are great people, we know a lot, but actually what we know is what our microbiota knows because our cells are less than our microbial cell. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about bacterial cell predominantly. We have not talked about fungal cell. We have not talked about fun other prokaryotes. We have not talked about viral cell. Much of this is unknown now. Now, before I go to the dysbiosis, let me tell you, Soro already said that major part of the microbes in our gut are gram-positive firmicutes, 60 to 80%, and gram-negative bacterioids are 20 to 40%. So what is dysbiosis? When do I call that this microbiota is not good, it has become dysbiotic. Whole world is making a mistake. Whole world is thinking dysbiosis means abnormal ratio of some microbes in the feces. No, fecal microbiota is not equal to the gut microbiota, what we have in the upper gut. So therefore, there is a fallacy there. With time, people will realize that. Second is, you have to see that much before we talked about microbiota in this decade, or microbiota dysbiosis in this, in this decade, gastroenterologists talk, used to talk about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So what is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is excess of bacteria in your gut. So it is not only the quality can differ, quantity can also differ. It is like if you have a huge population, they are all good people, still it is overcrowding. Same is the story. So what is dysbiosis? Dysbiosis is the abnormal number, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, I will talk about later. Microorganisms in altered quality, we are talking in all diseases, the literature is talking about fecal microbiota, but we need to know more about the upper gut microbiota and microorganism in an abnormal location. For example, the upper gut is supposed to have, not supposed to have coliform. So what are the coliform? These are gram-negative bacteria which can, or gram-negative bacilli which can ferment lactose. So they are not supposed to be in the upper gut. Now, if they are there, like Klebsiella is there in the upper gut, if Proteus is there in the upper gut, if E. coli is there in the upper gut, this is not abnormal. So therefore, microorganism in abnormal location is also is viable. So this is just to show you that upper gut has very less bacteria. For example, stomach has 10 to 1 or no bacteria at all. And these are mainly acid tolerating bacteria because stomach has a lot of acid. So therefore, acid tolerating bacteria are helicobacter, lactobacillus. Whereas if you go to the lower gut, such as colon, what you have is a lot of anaerobes, they are bacillus, and they are mostly lactose fermenting bacteria. Now, how to study the upper gut bacteria? So the, what we do is that we are gastroenterologists, we put an endoscope, and through the endoscope, we put a catheter, and we aspirate the content of the fluid from the upper gut. But there is a fallacy there. The fallacy is, if you took a, took a catheter through the biopsy channel of the endoscope or through the oropharynx or nasopharynx, what you are going to do is you are going to sample the oropharyngeal bacteria, you are going to sample the nasal bacteria, it is not equal to your duodenal bacteria. So therefore we devised a catheter some time ago, we published on this, and this catheter has two lumens. The inner lumen is protected by the outer catheter. The outer catheter has an obturator. You go through the biopsy channel of the endoscope and then you push the inner catheter, the obturator comes out 
and then the inner cube will aspirate and not the outer cube. This prevents oropharyngeal contamination and we have already applied for patent. Looking at our technology, Gerard Holman from Australia recently developed a technology because you know some bacteria can adhere to the mucosa. So they will not be in the lumen. Like cholera will be in the lumen. Cholera cannot adhere to the mucosa. On the other hand, intro adhesive E. coli, they will adhere to the mucosa so well that they will not come out of the feature. Now what Gerald says is that we have to also study the mucosal microbiota. So how to study mucosal microbiota? He developed a catheter which is called Brisbane biopsy device. Now what it does is it has a double lumen. The biopsy forceps is inside the long outer tube which again remains sterile because of the obturator and you can take the mucosal specimen. So what is bacterial overgrowth? Bacterial overgrowth is more than 100,000 colony forming units per ml bacteria in the duodenal or jejunal fluid. Now we are talking now in a different technology because what is the problem? Problem is if I use culture technology like I was talking about this serial dilution technique by which you can know that how many bacteria are there in the fluid. But the culture is a problem. 30% of the bacteria are cultural. If you take gut bacteria, you can culture only 30% of them. 70% you can't culture. Therefore, this technology has evolved. This is 16S RNA, rRNA gene sequence. You can do by real-time PCR or by next generation sequence. Now, Dr. Sora was talking about the bacteria came before us. And the bacteria also kept on evolving. But the advantage is bacteria remain conserved in this region of the gene. So bacteria kept on changing. Bacteria kept on having evolution. But 16S rRNA gene remain quite conserved so that all the bacteria has this, which is a little similar. But remember one thing, this gene is not entirely similar. There is a region called V1 to V9. So V for variable. V1 to V9 region is quite variable. For example, Pseudomonas will have different sequence than E. coli, than Proteus, and so on. So therefore, because of this hyper variable region, you can tell, is it Pseudomonas or is it E. coli? But look at this sample. What studies are now suffering is they are taking fecal sample alone because fecal sample is easy to obtain. So I say this is convenient sampling method, which is one of the major flaw in any study when we do a clinical study. They will say you have used a convenient sampling method and not the proper sampling method. So your sample can be feces, your sample can be upper gut fluid and mucosal biopsy. And I'm sure in this decade, more data is going to come with upper GI fluid and mucosal biopsy. Let me come to the topic proper. Let us see how common is bacterial overgrowth in different digestive disorders. And uh, when I am talking about this is primarily bacterial overgrowth I am referring to. Bacterial overgrowth is more than 10 to our 5 colony forming unit per ml bacteria and upper gut fluid. Cirrhosis of liver can have bacterial overgrowth. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease can have bacterial overgrowth. Polycystectomy, if you remove your gallbladder, you can develop bacterial overgrowth. You know why? Because bile has antibacterial property, so that controls bacterial overgrowth. And if you have removed the gallbladder, there is a change in the hemodynamic kinetics of the bile secretion and uh, sort of enterohepatic circulation, and that can lead to bacterial overgrowth. If you take proton pump in here, which is give, taken in plenty in India out of the sort of without prescription. So keep on taking proton pump inhibitor means you reduce your acid secretion. Your stomach doesn't remain acidic. It becomes somewhat neutral or alkaline. You can develop bacterial overgrowth. If pancreas gets damaged, you can get bacterial overgrowth. You know why? Because pancreas also has antibacterial property. Like you know, there is, an, there is a protein called defensin. Defensin is produced inside the gut as pro-defensin. Now it is the trypsin which comes and it digests pro-defensin so that it becomes defensive. And the defensin is the antibacterial substance. So if you have pancreatitis, what will happen? This kinetics also will differ. Irritable bowel syndrome is a very common disorder. What is irritable bowel syndrome? Irritable bowel syndrome is a chronic condition. I know many of you might be suffering. 
where there is a lot of flatulence, a lot of gas, abdominal pain, you say sometimes I have constipation, sometimes I have, I have diarrhea, and whenever I go to the doctor, he says, you are absolutely fine, there is nothing wrong, I do an endoscopy, it is normal, I do an ultrasound, it is normal, I do a colonoscopy, it is normal, this is irritable bowel syndrome, it is related to the bacterial alteration in our gut, malabsorption syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease like in irritable bowel syndrome if you do an endoscopy you don't find any inflammation mucosa looks normal in inflammatory bowel disease you do an endoscopy you find big ulcers in the colon maybe in the small gut in Crohn's disease now this can cause bacterial overload if your bowel doesn't move that means there is a slow transit so if a river doesn't flow what happens the dust accumulates Similarly, if the bowel doesn't move because the transit has become slow, then there will be bacterial overgrowth as well as qualitative change in the microbiome. Immunodeficiency state can have bacterial overgrowth and dysbiosis, and I'll share with you GI cancer story. Now, this is the full data from the whole world. I just accumulated all the data and wrote a review article just to show patient of irritable bowel syndrome have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth whatever diagnostic methodology you may use compared to healthy people so bacterial overgrowth is commoner in idea this is our data on fecal sample among patient of irritable bowel syndrome and healthy control by 16s rrna gene sequencing <coughs> by real time this year and what we found is that you have a difference between fecal microbes in IVF patient compared to the control subject. Now, remember one thing, it is not only all are related to microbiota. How host react to the microbe is important. Like you get hepatitis B, you know, one patient gets hepatitis B, he becomes chronic carrier, he doesn't fight with the hepatitis B, he gives home to the hepatitis B. Another fellow gets hepatitis B, he fights with the hepatitis B, his liver fails, he develops permanent hepatic failure in seven days and he dies. That means host response to microbe is very, very important. Now, what is the host response to microbe? Let us say, in a, take an example, irritable bowel syndrome. So what we did is, we took 273 patients of irritable bowel syndrome, 209 in healthy control. And then what we did is, we did IL-1-RA gene polymorphism among them. What is IL-1 RA? Interleukin-1 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. Now what happens is, there is an interleukin-1 receptor obviously, because if the cytokine has to work, there is a receptor. Now this receptor is a protein, so that means it has a gene which is encoding for this protein. Now the gene can have polymorphism among healthy subjects. That means though we are 99% similar as homo sapiens, but there is a variation of about 1% and this is uh, we are different genetically a little bit. So this is polymorphism. And what we found is IL-1 RA is a receptor antagonist. So if somebody has more IL-1 RA, he will be less inflamed in response to bacteria coming in. Now what we found is IL-1 RA was overexpressed, gene was overexpressed in people who don't have IBS compared to those who have IBS. Also what we did is study their jejunal microbiota looked at the number of bacteria in the jejunum, that is bacterial overload, and looked at mucosal IL-1 RA level, IL-1 level, IL-1 alpha and beta level, among patients who had bacterial overload, those who didn't, did not have bacterial overload, and I found, yes, there is a difference. This is another thing that we recently studied. There is a receptor called toll-like receptor. You all know that. The toll-like receptor is a pattern recognition receptor. Like Dr. Sora was talking about, the bacteria has to be recognized and the bacteria survive. How do they survive? Because if your toll-like receptor finds that this particular bacteria is not damaging, is good bacteria. So you develop friendship with this bacteria. So this toll-like receptor will not lead to an immune response mounting. So what we looked at, we looked among IBS patient and healthy control toll-like receptor polymorphism, gene polymorphism, also looked at their cytokine level 
pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. For example, IL-10 is anti-inflammatory, IL-6 is pro-inflammatory. In response to microbe behavior in their gut, and it is very fascinating to see the microbe not only depend on the what microbe you have, but what gene you have. Do you have pro-inflammatory gene or do you have anti-inflammatory gene? Another digestive disorder that I'd like to share with you is you develop cholera. Like Dr. John was talking, John was talking about cholera. You develop cholera. Like children develop cholera, adults develop cholera. But is cholera as an acute disease? No. Look at this. People have now described that 10 to 20 percent of people who develop acute gastroenteritis any time in their life can continue to have a chronic problem in their bowel called post-infection irritable bowel syndrome. And we did a study in collaboration with ICPDRB Dhaka Bangladesh and Dhaka Medical College with SDPG. And what we found is people who develop acute gastroenteritis, in fact, cholera was the first time to show, we were so first time that cholera can lead to post-infection IBS. So that means there is a long-term consequence. Obviously, it will have a magnitude in your economy because if people keep on getting gastroenteritis, they will become chronically sick and therefore this will lead to trouble. Can the microbiota decide whether it will be malnourished or well-nourished? I'll not talk about obesity because it is outside GI disorder. Now look at this. This is a study. Primarily, it is a multicentric study. Bangladesh, India, all are partner, and they found what micro the children have decide how much calorie they will lose. Because if you have a lot of fermentude, you tend to extract a lot of calories out of it. Because whatever food you take, it extracts calories, and therefore you tend to become obese. Whereas if you have other microbes such as Pseudomonas, you tend to lose calories. So we all think it is because of deprivation of the diet that lead to malnutrition among them is not true. This study showed that is the hygiene and the type of microbiota you have, it will decide on calorie loss. One more thing, there's a very interesting study. People showed that if you take high fiber diet, what happens is you have good saccharolytic microbiota. But if you take less fiber diet, less carbohydrate diet, but take a lot of protein, like animal protein, you lose your saccharolytic microbiota, you get proteolytic microbiota. And these micro, what they start doing is, they tend to digest your mucus. So there is a mucus layer over the epithelium, it digests the mucus layer, and if it digests the mucus layer, any pathogen at a lower dose can go in. So this is the beauty, and that's why in the West, they have a lot of sort of infection occurs easily, they develop post-infection IBS easily, even I'll talk about colon cancer later. Partly it is related to the meat they take. They not only take meat, a lot of preservative, these are preserved meat that can also create trouble with microbiota. And this we at our Charaka Sangeeta, which was written uh, second CE, which wrote, that everything, every disease begins in your gut. Bile, pitta, and kapha. Pitta is bile, kapha is mucus, and bile is bacterial metabolite, that is gas. So only thing is whole world is now rediscovering what was said earlier, but we can't take pride of it, because obviously we have fallen behind the whole world in the science. Now question is, look at this. Microbe can cause carcinogenesis. There are enough examples. EV virus causes lymphoma and gastric cancer. H. pallori causes gastric cancer and primary gastric lymphoma. Hepatitis B, C causes liver cancer. Human papilloma virus causes head, neck cancer and anal cancer. Human herpes virus causes Kaposi's sarcoma. Now, only thing is that in India, H. pallori frequency is very high. 70% of adult Indian are H. pallori infected. Whereas, look at Japan. Their H. pallor frequency is much lower. Once upon a time it was 50%, now I know it will be lesser than that. But in India, gastric cancer frequency is low. So how is it possible? How do we reconcile that, that we have high frequency of H. pallori, low frequency of gastric cancer, it is related to microbiota. Now people are rediscovering that the microbiota will decide how H. pallori will react, whether it will cause gastric atrophy or not, that is decided by microbiota. Food matters, because when you take food which is rich in fat and protein, the protein has amino acid, which contains sulfur, which contains obviously nitrogen, and this leads to production of 
nitrate, nitrosamine, sulfur lead to produce production of hydrogen sulfide, and they are bad uh, metabolites. They can injure the epithelial cell. So a lot of protein means more cancer. That's why colon cancer is so frequent in the West, not so in India. Fat similarly causes bile acid alteration. So in the gut lumen, bile acid alteration, whereas carbohydrate is a good food. This is the literature which is just published in 2018 to show that what we are proposing is possibly right. Now, now I'll say a little bit about how to manipulate the microbiota. We are talking about probiotic, antibiotic and everything. This I'll skip because I know the gathering is not clinical. I think you will not like this slide. This is one of our study to show. It is the microbiota which will decide whether my drug will work or not. If somebody has bacterial overgrowth, I'm 90% sure that is going to get relief in the symptom. If somebody does not have bacterial overgrowth, then I'm reasonably sure that he will not respond to my treatment with antibiotics. Now, fecal transplantation is a new thing. This is being rediscovered in the West, but you know, fecal transplantation used to be done in China long ago. So the traditional uh, doctors of China, what they used to do, somebody has a poor GI health, he's not improving, he will give him yolo soup. What is yolo soup? Yolo soup is a fecal material from a healthy person. So the fecal transplantation is now in plenty. And here I share with you two recent studies on irritable bowel syndrome and fecal transplantation. This is one study which was done from Norway. And we have Dr. One, one of my friends from Norway here. Now, this is another study done from Denmark. Yeah, sorry, I'll end now. Now, negative, yeah, I, I heard you. I heard you. I'll now end. I, I now end, just 20 minutes ending. So now what happens is that fecal transplantation is one way to manipulate microbiota. Now, probiotic we are talking about. So probiotic, does it work in this GI disorder? Yes, here is a meta-analysis. And if you want to know more, this is the consensus document that we recently published. Now, I will, stop, don't, I will not talk much about NFLD or liver disease and microbiota relationship. We all now know that you go for an ultrasound and you find fatty liver. Why do you have fatty liver? We now know it is a metabolic disorder. If you have diabetic-like state, if you are obese, you will have fatty liver. Now, people are incriminating microbiota to cause fatty liver. And here are three, four papers to prove that. What happens is, now people have shown that a fellow who doesn't take alcohol, he doesn't take alcohol. But what happens is, they gave him a good carbohydrate meal, and they took their portal venous blood. Portal vein is the vein which carries blood from the intestine and stomach. Now what happens is, they measured alcohol in their portal vein, and they found their portal vein alcohol level is high. So how did it happen? It is because of some microbiota, they have peculiar property to ferment carbohydrates and produce alcohol. Example, E. coli, bacteroid, bifidobacteria, crossfidia, and ruminococcus. So here we thought this is a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, where it's producing alcohol in its gut and pouring it to directly into the liver. So therefore, let me conclude. Con I conclude that altered gut microbiota is important in the pathogenesis of several GI diseases, but things are evolving. We need more time to understand. However, most studies have evaluated fecal microbiota rather than mucosal or upper gut microbiota, and majority are only association studies. What is an association study? Association study means you took a disease group, you took a healthy group, and you found a difference. Association does not prove causation. We need more data on that. Obviously, we suspect that manipulation of microbiota using antibiotic, probiotic, and other potential methods are useful in the treatment of those conditions. It reminds me, in summary, the chicken egg story. Did the chicken can come first? Is it that the microbial dysbiosis came first and then the disease developed? Or is the disease development led to the microbial dysbiosis? We have to read it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gushan.